Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody ready? All right. Announcements this morning. Um, deacon nominations with the growth of our campus. We need more men to serve as deacons while we may see them passing the elements before the Lord's Supper, they do most of their ministry outside the walls of the church. From welcoming, welcoming new members to visiting our widows, they do so much that you will never see. Deacon nomination forms uh, are located in the ministry gallery. The Goodman Baby Shower Come and bless the Goodman family as they welcome Evan into the world this summer. A come and go shower with refreshments will take place on Sunday, June 11th, immediately following the Bible Fellowship group after. Children's Camp. Children's Camp will be June the 19th through the 23rd. Riverbend's Retreat Center in Glen Rose. It's for kids three through third through fifth grade. And uh, well, they'll have fun sleeping or not <laughs> in cabins, uh, zip lining, swimming, uh, playing crazy games. This year's theme is Eyes Up. The uh, cost is $235 and they register by April the 30th. Um, which, uh, okay, <laughs> it went up. If, if you didn't register by then, it went up. Um, What's the time frame on that? Get to go. Kids go, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Randy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the time frame on the, on the camp, other than the 19th through the 23rd. But registration is it's filling up so that they haven't already submitted information. And I think it's still open. Student camp. Um, the registration for high school, middle school, summer camp is open. That's the 26th, June the 26th through the 30th. And uh, there will be a parent camper meeting today right after church. So Vacation Bible School, um, VBS is from July the 10th through the 14th. It is open to children ages four through completion of the fifth grade. And uh, you can register on Realm or through the website don't forget to invite a friend. So, and there are still opportunities to serve. Those forms, I think, are out in the atrium. So. Community Link. Community Link in Saginaw is in need of volunteers, especially on Thursdays. If you have some free time on your schedule or no students needing service hours, this will be the place that you can plug in and extend the love of Jesus in our community. Apartment Life. Apartment Life has an opening for a family to move into a complex at Blue Stream Village off uh, Riverside in the Alliance Shopping Area. You will receive an apartment on the property and only pay half of the rent while you serve the residents at that location. So that is all of our announcements. So prayer requests. The praise report. All right. I have asked the group to pray for my wife and myself for peace and comfort. God is good. 
right. All right. Any Donna? Um, I had shared about um, our friend in Taiwan who almost in May. Yeah. And it was great for her last week. And she said God is answering prayer and they were bringing he is she is reaching out in the area where there are a lot of prostitutes, trying to really reach these young girls there. And she said God is bringing partners along, they're going along in that area, and they're they can have some people step out. Uh, we want to have Bible study. And some people who said business is bad, so we're looking for another job. And so Maddie said, keep praying. So she really feels like that. Right. That's in Dashon City. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. My daughter has been missing for six years, and she was found this past Sunday. So we know. Oh, sorry. Yes. All right. Well, we don't have her here today to lead our uh, worship. But I was going to ask for volunteers, but one stepped up. <laughs> one stepped up right here. So, <laughs> so I will turn it over to you, Mr. Barry. about the inexperienced music leader at a little country church. He said, turn over your turn over in your hymn book, which is really hard to do if you think about it. Let's turn to hymn number 296. I haven't, done, I haven't said that in a long time. Let's turn to hymn number 296. We have a story to tell to the nations. Now, who knows what is special about this hymn? It's a GA song. That's certainly true. This was the WMU hymn, the Woman's Missionary Union hymn. One of my earliest church memories is sitting by my mother in a Woman's Missionary Union meeting, and the lady sang, sang this hymn. So it kind of takes me back. Now, the emphasis in the, the quarterly for today's lesson is on doubting Thomas. But since Verse 21 is in our text, and I'm emphasizing mission, so that's, I took teacher's license today. All right, 296, we have a story to tell to the nations. See if I can start us out low enough. We have a story to tell to the nation that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. Darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword. And shatter the spear and sword. The darkness shall turn to darkness. And the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and life. We've a message to give to the nation that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us his son to save us. 
and show us that God is love. And show us that God is love. The darkness shall turn to dawn, and the dawning to new day brought. And Christ's kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and life. We must say good to show to the nation who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. The darkness shall turn to dawn, and the dawning to noonday bright. This great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and life. That's a great old hymn. God bless the W. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 20. We're just about to the end of our studies in John. And I'll be sad to see the uh, lessons. Ian, you, you want to say something, Brother David? Thanks, Brother. Uh, I will take only a few minutes for the Instagram. We're trying to get more people on Instagram. So just continue with your class, and I will do something a little bit. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you must be desperate for photographs. <laughs> Just continue your normal class, guys. Oh, okay. Okay. No, class is normal. Oh. Oh. We'll make Darlene sit in the corner. All right, John chapter 20. Uh, we studied the resurrection earlier. Uh, in the quarter. So today we're looking at uh, Jesus' post-resurrection ministry. And after Jesus rose again from the grave, uh, Luke uh, tells us in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus uh, taught his disciples and ministered to them for 40 days uh, before he uh, ascended into heaven. So that's what we're looking at today is Jesus' post-resurrection post -resurrection, uh, ministry. Uh, in John chapter uh, 20, verses 1 through uh, 18, we studied this earlier uh, when Easter came. Talked about how uh, Mary Magdalene, and, and we know other ladies too, uh, went to the tomb there in the garden and found that the Lord is, had risen uh, she runs back and tells Peter and John. Peter and John come running to the tomb. Uh, John outran Peter, but he just peered into the tomb. But Peter, always uh, the one who's not hesitant, uh, went right into the tomb. And, of course, they, they found it empty. And aren't we glad uh, that they did? And then Jesus appeared to uh, Mary especially, and uh, she recognized recognized him. Also, on that same day, in the afternoon, two of Jesus' disciples, not, not of the twelve, but two followers of the Lord were walking to Emmaus. And Jesus uh, joined them and was walking with them. And uh, they were talking about uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and what they'd heard about his resurrection. And Jesus said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know about this? And so, so they came to an end and they prevailed on Jesus to eat with them. And when he broke the bread and said grace, their eyes were opened. Luke tells us this. And then Jesus uh, explained the scriptures to them. And help them understand how his resurrection fulfilled Old Testament prophecies 
and prophecies uh, that he had made. And I've always wished I could have joined that, that meal. Just imagine uh, sitting there at supper with uh, Jesus and those, those two followers and hearing the Lord explain the scriptures. So what a blessing that must have been. Well, for our lesson today, what is the most amazing thing you've ever seen? What's the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your born days? I've seen demons cast out of people in power. Okay. Someone else. Besides mm -hmm. houses being cleansed of demons, I've uh, God used me as an instrument of healing. Very clumsy, arms length to me. Okay. And I was telling a little girl when I was selling cars back then. But the legs went to me, and there were so many that come across when I needed other brothers and sisters. And so he said, Well, I don't know about all that leg stuff, but I do know my arm is short. And she lifted them up, and what, two or three, two and a half, three inches? But I prayed, and the Lord just drew that leg, that arm went straight up. Amen. Amen. And I think I was more surprised, even though I'd done even <laughs> with legs before. All right, thank you, Randy. Mm -hmm. Someone else, something that was just amazing to you. Well, my mother said that the same me welcome called me congratulations. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what <laughs> I was trying to think myself, I, I thought of several things. One years and years ago, Barbara and I were on our on our rookie trip out to the Philippines and we broke our trip in Hawaii, spent a few days in Hawaii and up in the mountains of Oahu, we saw a triple rainbow, a triple rainbow. That was just, that was just amazing. Uh, of course, we've seen a lot of amazing things over the years, but for some reason that came to mind. What was the most amazing thing you've ever seen? We were in Africa out in a national park and uh, we went out about four o'clock in the Jeep and we weren't seeing anything. You know, the, it was still hot out here. Then as we came back in, on the same route back in, right at dusk, when it's cool down, here's, uh, our guide said, he estimated between 250 and 300 elephants. They were there before. They were in trees and various places. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you think about an elephant, big they had so many of them that we didn't see but then when they came out at dusk we did it was just it was amazing well we often say seeing is believing seeing is believing and that's kind of a theme uh in the gospel of john he makes a lot of connections between seeing and believing. And of course, that's one of the reasons Jesus did miracles, so that people would see his miracles and believe that he truly was the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. Of course, uh, we've studied how Jesus uh, turned the water into wine. We talked about how Jesus uh, gave two blind men uh, their sight. And uh, most remarkably, uh, Jesus uh, resuscitated Lazarus. And the Bible says a lot of people traveled to, to Bethany just to see Lazarus. They wanted to see this guy who had been uh, dead, who was now alive. But Mary Magdalene believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Why did she believe that? Yeah, she saw the empty tomb. And seeing 
she believed. She was convinced. So let's look at verse 19. We begin with our, our Bible text. Someone read uh, verse 19 for me. That evening of that first day, a week, five and forty gathered, with four his mom and three of Jews, Stephen came and stood among them and said, These people. All right, on the first day of the week, this is Sunday. So early in the morning, Mary Magdalene, the other women, Peter, John, they had seen the empty tomb. Then in the afternoon, Jesus had appeared to the two brothers walking toward Emmaus. Now in the evening, he appears to his disciples in a locked room. And it says they were had the doors locked because they feared the Jews. So they were afraid that the chief priests and their guards would do to them what had been done to Jesus. They were really afraid. And I want you to contrast in your mind that here are the disciples cowering, you know, hiding in a locked room for fear of the Jews. But on the day of Pentecost, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out and preached to the same folks with great boldness. So we see we see a terrific difference in the life of the disciples, the life of the apostles, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we don't know if this was just the, the 11 uh, disciples. Of course, Judas had hanged himself. Uh, so we don't know if this is just the 11 disciples or, you know, uh, were others there uh, with them. There's no way to tell from the text. But Jesus just appeared. Well, how is that possible? Okay, <laughs> that's, all, that's always a good answer. Well, this was Jesus' glorified body, his resurrection body. And in his earthly ministry, the previous three years, uh, Jesus had limited himself in time and space. Uh, he had foregone, uh, he had emptied himself of, of uh, divine uh, powers and had limited himself to being in one place at one time. Uh, but now that he's in his resurrection body, Jesus can uh, pass through walls, through doors, uh, uh, go from place to place, and he's not limited with time and space anymore. So that's very, very significant. So Jesus came, just appeared. Uh, again, the, the door was locked. The windows were barred. Jesus just appeared. He didn't knock on the door. He just appeared among them. And he said, peace be with you. Now, really, that has a double meaning. The obvious meaning is peace. That's it's just the standard greeting in ancient Palestine. This was their standard greeting. We say, hi, how are you doing? They would say shalom, which just means peace in Hebrew. And so, uh, so it was natural that Jesus would say, peace be with you. But in this case, it had a double meaning. They really needed peace. Why were they troubled? Yeah, obviously they were afraid of the Jews. And what else? They were concerned about what happened. Okay, they're trying to figure out what happened to Jesus. What else? They were they they were afraid. They were apprehensive. They were worried about what might happen to them. And what else? They had just lost their king. That's right. I mean, you know they. Didn't know if Jesus was going to lead them as he had done. Sure. What else? What do we do now? Yeah. What, what, what's our future? We, we thought we had this figured out. Jesus was going to establish his earthly kingdom. We're all going to have cushy jobs in his earthly kingdom. And, you know, we're going to be his cabinet. And we're all going to live happily ever after. And so that's what they anticipated. And, well, it's not working out like that. And so I'm sure they were wondering, okay, what next? You know, what, what's 
we threw in with Jesus, what's going to happen to us? Yeah. And very understandable. So when, when Jesus said, peace be with you, these guys needed peace. These guys needed peace. All right, someone read uh, verse 20. All right, so Jesus proved to them who he was by showing them uh, the wounds uh, in his hands and his side. And remember, the Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear, and water and blood flowed out. You might be interested to know that, that I was teaching a Bible study uh, there in uh, Penang, Malaysia, several years ago, about 10 years ago now. And we had two medical doctors from Iran, two medical doctors from Iran, uh, who came to that Bible study. They were doing a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship in the treatment of drug abuse at Malaysia Science University. And their government had paid for them to come to Malaysia and uh, learn about the treatment of drug abuse. And while they were there, we got them, we got them in, our, in our Bible study. We, we won several uh, Iranians to the Lord there uh, through that university Bible study, praise the Lord. And so we were studying that passage, and I said, you know, I said, when the Roman soldier stabbed Jesus' side with a spear, water and blood flowed out, and that showed that Jesus had died and his body was beginning to decompose. And one of them said, that's absolutely right. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right, medically speaking. And so Jesus showed them his hands, and his side. And what did they do? What does it say? They rejoiced. Yeah, they rejoiced. So we see a big shift in the, in the emotions, the attitude of the disciples. What were they before? They were scared to death. That's a good way to put it. And now what are they doing? Rejoicing. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. When they realized that it was Jesus with them, they rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And remember, the kind of the theme of this lesson is seeing is believing. All right? Verses 21 through 23, who can read that? He was said to them that he could be believed, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sent you. And when he said this, he breathed on Okay, we're going to camp here and build three tabernacles. Uh, here, in this is really the a, a precious passage and so, so important. So Jesus said to them again, uh, peace be with you. And remember, Jesus had said that to them in John 14, 1. Uh, so Jesus said this to his disciples again and again and again. He said, why? Well, because they needed peace. They needed it really badly. Then Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. In other words, Jesus is saying, in the same way that God sent me, now I'm sending you. I read an article once. A New Testament uh, professor, New Testament scholar, said that in his estimation, Jesus spent two-thirds of his time training his disciples. Now think, think about this. Jesus spent three years with his disciples, and this scholar said, based on my studies, that I believe Jesus spent about two-thirds of his time training his disciples. To do what? Yeah, to witness, share the gospel. Yeah, he was training them to continue his ministry. Uh, that's what we did as missionaries, wasn't it? We were 
we all tried to train people to take our place uh, so that we didn't have to be replaced by missionaries, but rather we were replaced by uh, local believers, national believers. And that, that's the way it's supposed to work. And often it does, praise God. And so Jesus is saying, I'm sending you to continue my ministry. And Jesus had demonstrated for three years how to do ministry. And now he's saying, okay, now it's your turn. I'm turning this over to you. As the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. Well, this is one of the great commissions. Now, if I said great commission, what passage of scripture comes to mind? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we call that the Great Commission. But if you took my course on introduction to missions, <laughs> you would learn, as you will this morning, that actually there are five different Great Commissions in the New Testament. Each one of the Gospels and the Book of Acts contains a Great Commission. So someone read for us Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Some of you know it by heart. Yeah. Donna smiling. <laughs> Soul missionaries, we, we've taught on it so many times. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so in this great commission, we see our authority to go forth and make disciples in Jesus' name. He says, all authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. So when we go out to make disciples, to witness for the Lord Jesus, we are going with his authority, then also Jesus clarified the assignment for the church. What was the assignment he gave us? Make disciples. Make disciples. Not converts. Disciples. What's the difference between a convert and a disciple? Disciple is following in the footsteps of the master. Right? A disciple is the is a follower of the Lord. A convert needs to be disciple. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, we're living in Texas here. What's the difference between a cow and a calf? Well, maturity. 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 Yeah. A calf can't can't reproduce, but a cow can. And so the Lord wanted us to be mature followers who could reproduce. Yeah. So the Lord wanted us not to be baby Christians, but mature Christians who could reproduce ourselves. And then what's the assurance that we see in this passage? He'd be with us. He'd be with us. He said, I'll be with you always. Yeah. One time in the Philippines, I was riding in an open bonka, little, little outrigger boat, and the waves came up high. And I mean, it's like I could reach out and touch those waves. And I thought about this verse, and lo, I am with you always. <laughs> it doesn't mean position. That's the way I took it that day, and it comforted me. All right, Jesus said, I'm going to with you always. And you think about it, those guys needed some assurance. Because Jesus had just said, okay, I want you 11 guys to go and make disciples of all the nations. And I'm just guessing they're looking looking at each other and they're thinking, I'm not sure I can do that. I know he can't do that. <laughs> well, just think about that. What if the pastor stood up on Sunday morning, picked 11 people at random from the congregation, brought them up to the platform and said, okay, I want you all to go and make disciples of the whole world. How do you think they would feel? Intimidated? 
scared, overwhelmed. And Jesus said, hey, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. All right. So there's the Great Commission in Matthew. So let's read the Great Commission in Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So what's added here is preach, go proclaim, proclaim. Yeah. So that's really important to proclaim the good news of, of salvation. Then Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things? All right, so Jesus gave us the gospel in a nutshell, that he died on the cross, and that he rose from the grave, and he said, you need to preach this everywhere. But he adds adds one thing to what's preached. What word is that? Repentance. 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 That's really important. Really important. Uh, a lot of preachers have forgotten that word these days. You, you don't hear much about repenting of sin, but you've got to repent of your sin so that you can have faith. You know, salvation is is making a U-turn, so it's repentance and faith. And someone, they argue at the seminary about which one comes first. My response is, as long as you get them both done, it's fine. Yeah. You know, you, you know, as long as you've repented and expressed faith, get both of those things done, it's okay. It's okay. I think it's two sides of the same coin. Now, the, a theology professor would be aghast. But, but, uh, I've been on the front lines preaching this stuff. All right. So... And where were they supposed to begin? Well, why did he tell them to begin in Jerusalem? That's where they were. Where they were. It's not very complicated. <laughs> just, just start where you are. Work your way out. All right. Then John chapter 20, verse 21. Someone read that again. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. Father has sent me. I want to be with you. In the same way. We'll talk talk more about that in just a second. Then Acts chapter 1, verse 8. All right. Now, what does, what does this great commission add? All right. Yeah, it, it's going to be that we're going to be going out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the whole earth. Okay. What else? Holy Spirit. Yeah. We, we, we jump right into the geographical expansion from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, the whole earth. We forget the first part of the verse is he said, you should, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. They can't do the latter until they get the former. In other words, they can't, they can't do the missionary work until they have Holy Spirit power to get it accomplished. Yeah, and uh, we're bad to, bad to forget that part. All right, any question about these? Did you ever think about there was a, a great commission in each gospel and then the book of Acts also? <clears throat> you never thought about that. Well, you have now. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you think? Well, what do you, you think it's significant that Jesus repeated this over and over? Yeah, you, what'd you say, darling? I said, that's how you love me. That's it, that's right. Yeah, you have to. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, well. Yeah, well, when our kids were teenagers, I said, I'm just going to make a tape recording of my morning speech and just play it. I don't need to, you know. Because I said the same thing every every morning, you know. Did you brush your teeth? Have you got your homework? Is everything in your backpack? I mean, you know, morning after morning, and I'm thinking, I'll just make a, I'll just make a tape. <laughs> Save my breath. 
Well, in the Bible, when something is repeated, it's repeated for emphasis. Emphasis. And so, I mean, Jesus is hitting this a lick in every gospel and in the book of Acts. Over and over. Pounded. This is what he wants us, wants us to do. And this is what the Lord will evaluate us. You know, it's not... You know, it, it's not who's got the coolest lights in the auditorium. It's not who's got the greatest praise band. You know, it's not who's got the most attractive worship center. I mean, those things are, are nice, but what does, what's important to the Lord? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the, the main thing. All right, any comment, question? All right, pressing on. Let's talk about John chapter 20, verse 21. In the Christian Standard Bible, it said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So how did, how did God send Jesus? You know, I thought about that one time. And... What did Jesus do? Well, Jesus submitted himself to the Father. So if, if we go out with the same attitude, with the same spirit as Jesus, we're going to submit to the leadership of God, our Heavenly Father. How did Jesus pray there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Now, not my will, but your will be done. Most of our prayers are prayers trying to persuade God to adopt our way of thinking and approve our plan. But Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And Philippians chapter 2, in Philippians chapter 2, the apostle Paul said, Jesus humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. Okay, so what should we do? Submit. Yeah, submit. And trying to get people to take their hands off their life is a big challenge. Uh, I was talking to a group of teenagers one time, and uh, they were either beginning drivers or about to be drivers or hoping to be drivers. And I said, okay. The question is, who's holding the steering wheel in your life? Who's steering? <laughs> they did a double take and they, they looked at me and I said, well, who's steering your life? You or the Lord? Well, they didn't much want to think about that. They did, you know, that, you know, they, they had their own hopes and dreams and, and trying to help, help young people understand that the most important thing in life is to do the Lord's will for them. And of course, a lot of them think that if you do what God wants you to do, you may be obedient, but you'll be miserable. But that's not the truth at all. Doing, doing the Lord's will may be difficult. It's you know, So we're sent to submit. We're also sent to sacrifice. Sacrifice. Someone read Mark 10.45. I just saw on uh, the internet, there's a whole book that's been written on Mark 10, 45. This guy's written, said, said this is the key to understanding Jesus. It says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. And Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for men. So, what, what are we supposed to do? Well, like Jesus, we're supposed to sacrifice. Sacrifice ourselves for the Lord, for the sake of the gospel. Follow him. Yes. In 2 Corinthians 4, the Bible says, what we see in the Jesus Christ is Lord, and tells us who is I think that's, I think, pretty easy. So, 
Now, this sacrifice, people used to say, oh, you missionaries, we have four missionary couples in this class. So we, we feel like we're kind of distinctive. <laughs> lots, of, lots of old missionaries in here. Uh, if we weren't old, we wouldn't be in this class. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. I'm not your enemy for telling you the truth. All right. Yeah. But, you know, people used to say, oh, you missionaries, you make so many sacrifices. Well, to me, the, the, the only sacrifice I thought that we made was to be separated from family and friends, ranch dressing, Dallas Cowboys football. Uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, I felt like we were blessed in so many ways. The sacrifices were, were rather minor other than separation from family. That was, that was a significant thing. But, you know, he said, well, you know, you sacrificed a lot for the Lord. Well, compared to what Jesus sacrificed for us, it pales in comparison. And so we're, we're called on to sacrifice ourselves. Some missionaries give their lives. I wish I could take you all on a field trip uh, to Rockville, Virginia, just outside of Richmond. If you go to the International Learning Center, that's... Uh, maintained by, owned and maintained by the International Mission Board. They have a wall of honor, and it's a long wall with lots of little brass plaques with names. Those are the names of the missionaries who died in missionary service. Lottie Moon's name is there. My friend Bill Hyatt's name is there. My friends Kathy and Randy Arnett, their names are there. A whole wall of names. Names of people who said, serving the Lord is worth my life. And they were willing to give their lives to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's certainly true. And we're also sent to what? Serve. Yeah. Jesus demonstrated a servant spirit. Now, what's one of the ways Jesus demonstrated servant spirit to his disciples? Yeah, he washed their feet. Yeah, that sent them back, didn't it? Remember when we studied that? You know, Peter said, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> Poor Peter. He, he always spoke first and thought later. And Jesus said, well, if you don't accept this, you're not, you're not one of my disciples. Peter said, well, in that case, go ahead. Yeah, then that's right. He said, wash all of me. That's exactly right. And, and Jesus said, no, that's not necessary. <laughs> Poor Peter. Yeah. But, you know, if we are sent to be like Jesus, then we will always have a servant spirit. Servant spirit that we are there to that we are in this world to serve other people. And Barb and I helped with the, the spring festival. On, they gave me a t-shirt. Miss Betty gave me a t-shirt. On the front of the t-shirt, it says, you know, Cross Church of North Fort Worth. On the back side, it says servant. And I thought, well, that's good. You know, I didn't, I just thought, well, I'll help out. But then I thought, well, you know, we are serving our community, blessing boys and girls with what we're doing here this morning, trying to introduce our church to uh, folks in our neighborhood. And, and what are some ways that, that we can serve? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of different ways. Helping at the school, right? Helping at the school, feeding the hungry, praying for the folks. Things that we do to take to the school. Yeah, uh, feeding hungry people. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we're looking at the food for children here. Because we're looking at to be with 
And that'll be our chance to feed hungry young people. Bring some food. I was thinking when Barbara and I served as missionaries, I mean, we we help sick people, we help dead people, you know, help people with funerals, help sick people get the medical care they needed, uh, help poor children get surgeries. You know, the Lord just, and that's beyond just the preaching and teaching and church planting, seminary teaching. The Lord, the Lord just gave so many varied opportunities to serve people and bless people. And isn't that what Jesus did? Uh, yesterday, I was looking for a post, and it's about a guy who he talked about what God is doing in the city streets. A guy who had since he sold his house, and he felt like God needed him to travel to the United States to just serve. Just serve. He was like, well, I know what to do. I don't know if I was praying, just God just works it out. So he told the story in that particular uh, episode. I had the guy was there. Uh, he walked up, he just went by this homeless man who was just sitting outside the store. And he just said hi to him. And he said, I don't know. He said, I just had a sense that I need to get this. But when he began to talk to him, come to find out this guy, he'd been in and out of prison. But uh, he, long story short, he introduced him to the Lord. Come to find out this guy is an artist. And within three to four months, this guy's life was just transformed. And the guy gave his testimony. He said, without God, none of this would have happened. He said, first of all, I had to give my life to God, and then God began to change. And I just thought, there you go. I mean, you know, who would have, you can't explain that. And this guy can't explain it, right? He was out there to serve others. Mm-hmm. Well taken. Okay. So let's look at verse 22. After saying this, he, Jesus, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. The Greek word here for breathe is a form of pneuma. And the Greek word pneuma can mean breath or it can mean spirit. Since the Old Testament word, Hebrew word ruach can mean breath or spirit. They they both they they both have a double meaning, mean breath in your body or the spirit of God. And so Jesus breathed on them and said, "Receive the Holy Spirit." Okay, well, the this means that Jesus began the process of their being baptized and then filled with the Holy Spirit. It began at this point, and when did it culminate? When did the process end? On the day of Pentecost. Yeah, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it says they were filled with spirit, and there were tongues as a fire above their heads, and they went out and preached the gospel in languages they'd never learned, and... A lot of missionaries have prayed for that to happen. Um, I never knew it to happen to a missionary, but they have no missionaries to pray for that. <laughs> they still had to do their study. Uh, but they, you know, the Holy Spirit filled them and they, they went out of the upper room and began preaching the gospel in languages they never heard and 3,000 people got saved. And so... You know, we don't understand all about this, but obviously the process of them being filled with the Holy Spirit began here, and it culminated uh, on the on the day of Pentecost. Any question about that? Okay, verse 23. Now, here's a tricky one. Uh, the What well, the quarterly had on this was pretty lame, uh, but... <laughs> But uh, I did some further research. Verse 23 said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
Well, when we in the Godfords uh, served in the Philippines, the Roman Catholics made up about 90% of the, of the population. Um, and Roman Catholics believe that the priest has the power to forgive sin or technically absolve people uh, from sin. And so when they go to, when Catholics go to confession, uh, they go into the confessional booth and the, the priest prompts them to uh, forgive their, you know, confess their sins, and they do, and then the, the priest says, I absolve you. Uh, in old Latin, they said, te absolvo. And the priest says, I absolve you. And they believe that the priest has the power that his ordination bestows on him, the spiritual power to actually forgive sin. Now, we don't agree with that. So what does this what does this teach? Well, the Bible knowledge commentary I thought had a really good uh, really good explanation of this. What we see here is that Jesus was giving the apostles and the church the privilege of announcing God's forgiveness. If one believes in Jesus, then we can announce their forgiveness. So we present the gospel to someone. They accept it. They believe it. And we can say, your sins are forgiven. You're saved. You've been born again. I remember, I remember going through this with a young Chinese fellow there in, there in Malaysia. And he said, is it that simple? And I said, uh, yes, it is that simple. It is that simple. I said, I said, did you pray sincerely? He said, oh, yes, I did. I said, well, you've been born again. You're saved now. And I showed him in you know, Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, that's God's promise for you. He said, okay. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I was glad to announce to him that because he believed in Jesus, his sins were forgiven. So that's what this means. Or if, if people refuse to believe, then we can say, if you reject this gospel, then your sins will not be forgiven. Okay? Can I drop an answer there for just a second? Sure. And ask for a request. Um, my daughter and son in law were I international Baptist missionaries mm -hmm. um, and um, had graduated from Washita. And um, he was the number one theologian in that year of graduation. Within a year after um, he started his master's at Birmingham, um, he was converted to Anglican and now they're Catholic. Um, he, it, this mama's heart just. Um, has been trying to get my head around that. And I specifically asked them about him solving sin. And that got me miscommunicated. Oh my goodness. Um, so that and other questions. Just um but um she's on child number five. She's about to have a fifth son. And I know the first two but not the last three. No, so um I know they have a lot of proof in them. They are two of the most intelligent Bible scholars that I know. But they have been completely deceived. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just have it your prayers. Okay, um, thank you. For my grandkids and my So he went from Wachita to Beeson? He did. Beeson Divinity School? He did. And uh, one of the English mm -hmm. doctoral professors there converted him. And then it took two years with my daughter crying every night, calling me on the phone, saying, you know, he's, he won't stop. And uh, mm -hmm. she finally gave in. And, and just as last year, he converted to him. So I was doing a good for him again. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, huge bird of us. Sure. Uh, Let's pray. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Why don't you pray for it, David? Father, we uh, we just pause as we uh, have been asked to to pray, and and we just want to lift this family up, and we want to lift this mother and grandmother up to you that. Uh, as she does what she can, that you would just show her ways that uh, 
he can be supportive and that uh, at some point we pray that the relationship would be restored and that they would uh, have an opportunity to be together and, and uh, interact with one another. And Father, we just uh, lift them up to you and know that in your hands is the best place they can be. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David. This reminded me, Atlanta, of, uh, when I was a seminary student, I took a course with Dr. Huber Drumright, who was the dean of the School of Theology back in the day. And one day, Dr. Drumright looked at us and he said, boys, and we were all young men in the class, he said, boys, there's a heartache in every pew. And that's true. That's true. You know, I, I, you know, I, I believed it when Dr. Drumright told us that, and that's been some years ago, and now I know it. I mean, I, believe me, I know it. All right, pressing on. So I've kind of made a little detour to talk about missions. Then we made a detour to talk about theology. So let's get back to the lesson for today. <laughs> In, in seminary, we call that chasing a rabbit, but I, I think these were worth chasing. Uh, let's look at verse 24. Remember, the, remember our setting here. The 11 disciples, or maybe more, had gathered in a locked room, and they're together, except for Thomas, and the Lord appeared to them and showed them his hands in his side. So verse 24. Someone read that. Now, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nail, and place my fingers into the mark of the nail, and place my hand into his, into his side, I will never believe. Now, by declaring that, Thomas, who was formerly called Thomas Didymus, meaning Thomas the twin got the new name, Doubting Thomas. <laughs> we, and we, we harass uh, Thomas for, for doubting. But someone read Matthew 28, 17. Someone read Matthew 28, 17. That's where we'll see. We, we usually we, we start with 18. Uh, but 17 is very re re revealing. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Uh huh. So, it, you know, we talk about doubting Thomas. I'm just pointing out he had company. <laughs> you know, they, they were struggling to comprehend, they were struggling to believe. And Thomas just blurted out what some of the others were probably thinking. And he said, look, if I don't, you know, if I don't see see the mark of the nails in his hands and and see his side that was riven by a spirit, I, I'm not going to believe. And so he was honest about his doubts. And we call him Doubting Thomas and over the years, I've had opportunity to talk to people who have doubts. And that's okay. You know, some people say, well, I, I know I shouldn't have a doubt, but I have a question about this. I have a concern about that. Well, in my mind, I think about honest and dishonest doubters. Now, honest doubters have a sincere question but they're looking for an answer. I mean, they're, they're seeking information. They're, they're seeking an answer that will, you know, speak to their doubt. Other people doubt and, you know, they express that, but they're really not looking for an answer. They're, they're just, they're trying to oppose Christianity or they're trying to throw you off, or trying to make you uncomfortable, or, you know, beat you down intellectually. And so 
Thomas doubted, but he was an honest doubter. And he said, it, it, if I can see his hands inside, then I'll believe. And we're going to meet people who have doubts, perhaps more now than in times past. Two reasons. One, it's fashionable to be an atheist or an agnostic now. An atheist says there is no God, and an agnostic says, well, I don't know if there's a God. I can argue a person out of atheism, but it's hard to argue an agnostic into faith. You have to, the Holy Spirit has to bring them. I've often been asked, you know, will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? And uh, the answer is yes. You know, the the uh, disciples were able to recognize Moses and Elijah and so and Abraham. Well, you know, so I, I think the answer is is yes. Uh, but you know, people make all kinds of questions. But you think about, you know, people have been burned in fires. And even if we're buried, you know, eventually our bodies uh, decay. And the this is not in the Bible, but it's in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And eventually our bodies do turn to dust. And But on the last day, uh, when the Lord returns, uh, then our bodies will be restored, uh, reconstituted by the Lord and reunited with our souls and we'll be with the Lord. And uh, just how all that works exactly is not explained. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions, you know, my, my child died as a baby. Will it, will it be a baby in heaven or an adult? I don't know. You know, the Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't say, uh, but, you know, I just believe God's going to work it out in a wonderful way. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, verse 25. No, yeah, 26. Sorry, verse 26. Someone read that. Okay, so Jesus is, appears to them again, greets them as before, uh, verse 27. And he said to Tom, put your finger here, and if it's too much, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithful, but believe. <laughs> so Thomas said, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus said, okay, here you go. Do you wonder how Jesus knew he wanted to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so Jesus said, okay, just just reach out your hand. You can you can poke it right into the into the nail hole. And then he ends, don't be faithless, but believe. And that was the challenge to Thomas. I mean, he had an honest doubt. Jesus allayed that doubt, answered that doubt. He said, now, you've got what you asked for. Show some faith and believe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the timing of it, you know, who knows. Uh, but uh, Thomas asked for it and he got it. And Faithless, says in the Christian Standard Bible, actually in Greek means without faith. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't be without faith. Show some faith. And ultimately, uh, it is a matter of faith. Now, Thomas got to see 
do we get to see? Barbara says, no. Well, look at verse 28 and 29. Someone read that. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who are they? Us. us. Yeah, that's us. Any of you seen Jesus? I mean, I saw the picture on the wall in my in the Sunday school room, you know, when I was a little boy. But have any of us seen his seen his nail scarred hands? Do we want to? Yeah, we sure do. I tell you what, I'm sorry, Miss Kay's not here. She's kind of my old gospel hymn uh, consultant. But there's an old old gospel hymn. It says, I shall know him by the print of the nails. And he says, I shall know him, I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails. That's so interesting. There's so many things that it Well, think about us. We've read the New Testament how many times? <laughs> Do we still struggle with faith and to believe? And how, how many of us would say, well, I've got, I've got all the faith I need. Would you say that? No, we'd all say, oh, I need more faith. Wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? But if we have faith, what can happen? Move mountains. Yeah, there you go. You know, always that found us a little bit of slack because earlier in the Gospels, when Jesus was going to make this nice trip toward Jerusalem, the disciples were all concerned because the authorities there wanted to kill Jesus. And finally, Thomas picks up for the group and says, Well, let's go. We can all die with him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he wasn't so big with that. You know, I appreciate Thomas. I think I was teaching the week we talked about John chapter 14. And, you know, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and where I go, you know. You know how to go there. And Thomas said, Lord, we, we don't know how to go there. <laughs> and I appreciate Thomas because he just voiced, you know, what the others were thinking but, but didn't say. And I was so glad Thomas said that because Jesus responded by, by speaking what's in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but my name. And he means what he meant is if you know me, you know the way. Yeah. Mark 15, verse 14. Jesus said, I was a revelation to me when we were at seminary and I was typing his expertise. <laughs> and verse chapter 14, that I pray not for these alone, but for those who would believe because of their words. And it struck me like lightning that Jesus prays for me. Yeah. And then back to Thomas, uh, he hadn't seen, he wasn't with the group that had seen the institute. And we don't know why he wasn't there in the upper room later that day. You know, so. You can give him a little slack, <laughs> There you go. Well, we're 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 all somewhat like Thomas, I, I believe. But you know, Thomas was blessed because he saw and believed. But Jesus said, "More blessed are those who believe without seeing." And one day, our faith will become sight. We have Thomas saw and believed. We have believed, and one day we will see. But what a blessing that will be. We'll behold him. We'll behold him. And how will we know him? By the marks of the nails in his hands. You know? 
say, and you are just making all the Muslims you get around the world now. When Jesus is appearing to them, they have no the opportunity. Yeah. That's, that's who you take the place. They haven't grown up knowing that, but yet, who makes themselves known to them? Now, that's an amazing thing that the Lord gives dreams about Jesus to Muslim people. And most Muslim converts testify to having seen Jesus in a dream. Final comments, questions? Similar situation with a team of Chinese people in Taiwan who we went into Myanmar. They were walking through this village, and this lady who was at a temple there came up to them and said, I came to worship in this temple, but the God here told me that I shouldn't do that, that there's someone coming here to tell me about Jesus. <laughs> that was real. And she accepted her. All right, someone else? All right. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the wonderful passage of scripture we had to, to study today. Lord, we're, we're, we're thankful that you include us in the work of your kingdom, that you send us, and Lord, help us to be uh, faithful, uh, faithful to fulfill our responsibility uh, to go out in your name, tell people about you. And Lord, we're, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that empowers us uh, to do that. And Lord, we're thankful for the blessed hope, uh, the hope that one day uh, we'll, be, we'll be with you. Dismiss us now with your blessing. We pray in Christ's name.